Good evening. We're glad to have you tonight as I want to share with you something that has made a great um, change in my life when I came to understand this particular doctrine that's found in the scriptures. And it has to do with the subject of dispensations. When I mention that word, it probably brings to your mind a lot of different things. And uh, yet, I remember when I was in college, I had a couple of professors try to teach it to me, and uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. But when I got into seminary, uh, one of my professors explained it to me, and the Holy Spirit illuminated my mind to it. And it made such a world of a difference in my life. And I want to share with you some things uh, from the scriptures tonight that hopefully will be of help to you. You know, when you stop to think about the Bible, uh, my Bible has, let's see here, it, it has approximately, uh, let's see here, over 1,700 pages uh, in the Bible. I have a Muslim friend who's an educated man, and he hasn't read through the, the Quran yet, and I understand that in fact Muhammad himself didn't write it. He had a lot of sayings that others penned or put down on paper. But uh, tonight I want to help you understand the Bible. Now in order for you to understand the Bible uh, more than just the historical facts of the Bible, uh, I want you to, as a result of my sharing this information with you, I'm hoping that it will revolution revolutionize your life and really get you excited as you think about where we are in time and uh, how soon things are going to happen. Now I have a chart if you're uh, on with me live right now and if you don't have this chart I'd like to encourage you to do so. It's not original with me I just kind of compiled it together and um, in fact uh, Dr. Tom Ice and Tim LaHaye have a very excellent book entitled Charting the End Times and I would encourage you to get it uh, by Dr. Thomas uh, Ice in fact, uh, Thomas Ice has been in our church a couple of times, and I've never had the opportunity to meet, uh, at, uh, be acquainted with uh, Dr. LaHaye, but it's a very excellent book, and I would really recommend it to you. And then, of course, I have uh, I shared with our folks, it's on a green sheet here, uh, it's called uh, The Order of Events That Are Coming. Now, we believe that the next event on God's time calendar is the rapture of the church. A lot of people scoff at that. Some people use the rapture and they talk about, they confuse the rapture and the second coming and the end of the world. And I think of Harold Camping who a few years ago, in fact on my anniversary, I think it was in 2011, he said in 2011, I think it was on May 21st, he said the Lord is going to come back, the rapture is going to happen. Of course it didn't. And there have been those who have made predictions that didn't come to pass and as a result of that there are many scoffers out there today who are uh, you know, saying, you crazy Christians, and, and I was just reading something today that the younger generation is not really interested in Bible prophecy as some of the older generation were in the late 1900s and even before that, but uh, the younger people seem to be more concerned about social justice, and they're bring, being brainwashed into thinking that we need a one world government, a one world religion, a one world economic system, and that's the direction that we're heading. And it's going to come, the Bible predicts that it is going to come. Uh, we have shared with you how President Trump, he is more of a nationalist, the others have been more globalists, and they think that, they honestly think that they're going to be able to bring peace to this earth, and yet God is only going to allow man to have seven years to have this experiment and it's going to be called the time of Jacob's trouble, the last three and a half will, years will, because um, that's the time when God's going to specifically uh, allow the devil to uh, really cause havoc in the lives of the Jewish nation. The first half of the tribulation, uh, the Jews are protected by this agreement that the Antichrist is going to make with them. Uh, this Antichrist, or the man of sin, will come out of the uh, European nations uh, from the revived Roman Empire and they will have a ten, uh, ten rulers at that time and that will probably be the result of uh, if the, when the rapture takes place it, there's going to be a tremendous void that is uh, right there and uh, martial law will no doubt have to be declared and then people are in fact right now people are very lawless and uh, anarchy will prevail and they're going to clamor for 
you know, the, for the government. Well, you have basically four regions. You've got the Western Hemisphere, you have the Eastern Hemisphere, you have the North and the South, and they're all kind of vying for power as to who's going to run the show. They, they talk about, you know, one world government, a one world church, but we want to look at some of those things tonight. Now, as we think about dispensations, in fact, I, I really, what you can do to get this chart is uh, you can go to my website. It's just simply kelseypeach.com. And if you go uh, on just kelseypeach, P-E-A-C-H dot com, and then you go to the left bottom, you can click right on there, and then it'll come up with this chart, and then you can download it. Now, I would like for you to do that, and then uh, maybe in the next, uh, another program, I'll go uh, through it with you step by step to try to help you understand it. Because I'm really hoping and praying that not only will you know for sure that you have eternal life, I didn't know for sure that I was saved until I was 19 years old. And uh, I'm thankful that I know today, based on the scriptures, that it says, He who believes in the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. I've trusted in Christ as my personal Savior. I believe that He died for my sins and rose again. And that's the essence of the gospel that someone has to believe today in order to be saved. It's not all this other stuff. In fact, we've shared with you on some of our blogs. Uh, Ron Shea has put out a very excellent little booklet, and I uh, have it oftentimes at the bottom of my blogs for somebody to read through it. It's about a 30-page thing. But if you have any doubts as to your salvation, I would really encourage you to read that and make sure, because once you're sure of your salvation and the Holy Spirit has borne witness with your spirit that you are indeed a child of God, according to Romans chapter 8, verse number 16, then you can begin to understand the things that are found in the Scriptures, and especially the deep things of the Scriptures. You see, an unsaved man, they can understand the historical uh, parts of the Bible, in fact, uh, but that when it comes to New Testament grace teaching, they just don't really seem to get it or many other parts of the Bible. Uh, so it's, it is our desire to help you to understand uh, what dispensations are all about. And we believe that there are three major dispensations that are found in the Word of God. Obviously, the Old Testament is made up mostly of the Mosaic Law, which was given to Moses, who was the steward of the household manager to dispense to the Jewish people who even before they heard what God was going to impose on them, they said, well, just lay it on us. God, all that the Lord has said, we will do. And of course, it proved to them that no, they didn't do that. Uh, in fact, every dispensation, we will find out, every dispensation, including the future one, when Christ himself is ruling as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when all the needs of man are, are met, uh, because the conditions that are going to be dramatically changed during that thousand-year reign of Christ, the devil will be bound, the sin nature will be curbed, and there won't be any world system that will be you know, tempting the uh, unsaved people or the people here on earth. And so it's going to be a very different uh, time period. Now, when you think about dispensations, you need to understand that uh, the Apostle Paul, in fact, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, for this reason... He says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if or since indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he, God, made known to me, and specifically Christ, the mystery, as I have written briefly, uh, as I've briefly written already. I made a mistake last, um, I caught myself afterwards. I referred to a mystery in Acts chapter 16 instead of Romans chapter 16, verse number 25. A mystery, Romans 16, 25, is that which was previously unknown, but once it has been revealed is no longer a mystery, and it should not be mysterious, especially to Christians who desire and are willing to study the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, study. Most people, they get down with high school and they say, oh, I'm not going to open another book. That's the foolish, most foolish thing you can do. Most of the stuff that you know you see on TV and all the rest of the stuff on the newsstand, it's not worth your time. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. But the Word of God is God-breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, in order that the man or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And folks, if there ever was a time when we need to know the Word of God, and not only to know the Word of God, but live according to the Word of God, and then help others who are struggling in their Christian life, uh, one of the reasons I do what I do and I enjoy what I'm doing is because I've been through many of these trials and tests myself. I'm finishing up the book of First Peter in our Sunday evening services. And Peter himself, uh, remember he said, I'll never deny you, Lord, and he did. 
And the Lord said, well, when you are turned around, he says, strengthen your brethren. And that's exactly what Peter did. But here in, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul refers to himself as the steward of the household manager, which, and this mystery concerning the grace truth, was not in the Old Testament times. They didn't know that, see. Uh, this whole period of the dispensation of grace, uh, now we will try to distinguish between dispensations and ages. They're not the same thing, even though... Uh, eight, and people often call it the uh, church age and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you want to refer to it, the era. But really, technically, it's the dispensation of the grace of God that was given to the Apostle Paul while he, right after he was saved, uh, he went out of the desert for three years. He was personally taught by the Lord himself, and he was given this information concerning grace truth to share it with us. And so he says, uh, this this mystery was given to me, he says, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery concerning Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been already or revealed by the Holy Spirit to his apo holy apostles and prophets, that the, the purpose is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which he says, I, Paul, became a minister according to the gift of the grace of of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me who am less than the least of all the saints this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ to make all see what is the, dis, uh, the fellowship of the mystery that previous mystery which from the beginning of the ages was hidden in God who created all things in Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to principalities and powers, referring to spirit beings, the lower, the lower two categories, in the heavenlies, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence, uh, with confidence through faith in him. Now, this is very important for us to understand uh, that, uh, in fact, in Titus chapter 1, I shared with you, I think, on a previous occasion, in, cha in Titus chapter 1 and verse number 9, we have two different Greek words that are used here by the Apostle Paul as he writes to Timothy. And uh, the translation is kind of unfortunate here. He says, but this is in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, he says, holding fast the faithful word. Now, this is the word uh, didacane, which means the doctrines which are to be believed and practiced. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine, the New Testament grace teaching that the, that the apostles were receiving from the Lord as to how New Testament Christians were to live. Now, he goes on holding forth holding fast the faithful word. That's the Greek word which has to do with doctrine that is to be believed in practice. As you have been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine. Now this is a different Greek word, which means, uh, it's the word didaskalia, which means doctrines that are to, to be believed but not practiced. Now it's it should be obvious that the rules between the Old Testament law and grace teaching are quite different. Now, obviously, there are some things that are similar. Nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, but when you're living according to, when you're living by law, uh, by, by love, then these other things, you're, you're not going to be doing them. Say, while you're doing one thing, you can't do the other. It's kind of like 1 John 2, 15 through 17, when uh, the Apostle John writes to the maturing believers, and he says, you guys stop loving the world, because if any man should love the world, you can't at the same time love God the Father. So when, you ha when you're demonstrating the, or dis displaying the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, the Holy Spirit produces that in the lives of believers that are rightly related to Him, and then we become responsible to direct it as needed at the right time and the right place toward the right person, you see. Uh, because you can misdirect, even as a spiritually maturing believer, you can misdirect the fruit of the Spirit, and you're not supposed to do that. You can find joy in something other than God and in His Word. See? And the same thing with all the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. So as we think about this dispensation of grace, we want to, uh, you know, when you get this thing downloaded, I'll try to uh, go through it step by step. And, uh, because it's, and as I say, it's not original with me. I just kind of compiled it together. I worked on it for quite a long time, and I had to, one of the art teachers in the school where my boys attended uh, put on some of the, the little pictures here to help you get a grasp of it. 
because if you try, for example, um, if you try to live by the Mosaic law to come to spiritual maturity, it'll never take place. The whole purpose of John or Paul's writing the Gospel, uh, Galatians is to demonstrate to those believers, they were believers, they were saved by God's grace through faith in Christ and the gospel that he died for our sins and rose again. He says that. He said, but now why are you people who are Christians trying to come to spiritual maturity by keeping the Mosaic law? You can't do that. Now, if you listen to a lot of preachers today, they like to go to the Old Testament, take all these stories. You know, many of them are, probably aren't even saved and they don't understand grace teaching. But if you if you don't make that distinction, you will never come to spiritual maturity. Now, we're going to show you on this chart, if you get it, and we'll try, try to dis explain to you, that our rules for living are generally, now please notice, generally speaking, are found between John chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 3. Now you say, what happens to John 13? Well, in John chapter 13, Jesus gives a new commandment to his disciples. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. In the Old Testament, the standard was you love your neighbor as yourself. But in the, the grace teaching is you love each other as I have loved you. Now you can't do that unless you're spirit-filled. And so that's when the new commandment was given. And so generally speaking, now notice generally speaking, I say not, you know, there are some passages or sections after in Matthew, Mark, like Luke, and John, and so forth, that, but in that time frame, it also corresponds with what you have in Matthew chapter 16, where after Jesus has been rejected by, his, by the nation of Israel, he says in, in Matthew chapter 16, there's a key uh, verse here that is very important. After Peter makes this great declaration, he, when he, Jesus asks, well, who do men say that I am? Peter says, well, you are the Christ. You are the promised Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, that is what these people in, in that time had to believe about Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Now, I know there are some people who say, well, in all the Old Testament people, they looked forward and, you know, they believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I challenge you to, to prove that from Scripture. Yeah, they did see veiled... Uh, ideas from that from the scriptures but even peter himself did not believe that christ was going to go to the cross and die he was looking forward to his setting up of the kingdom but christ says here and uh, he says blessed are you simon barjona for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you but my father who is in heaven he's the one that explained it to you he says and i say to you you are peter on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against him. Now there's kind of a play on words here in Matthew 16, 18. He says, you are Peter, a little ship of a stone, but I'm going to build my church on my on myself, my, the rock. Now here in Morro Bay, not far from us here, there's this huge rock that protrudes out of the, out of the ocean there. And it's like that, or the rock of Gibraltar, maybe you could think of it as, as opposed to a little pebble on the street. Well, Peter was like a little pebble on the sea. He was the Petros. But the Petra is referring to Christ, the large, massive rock upon which the church would be built. And then he talks about the keys of the kingdom, and we won't deal with that right now. But then verse number 20, this is Matthew 16, 20, he says, Then Jesus commanded his disciples that they should tell no one from here on out that he was the Christ or the Messiah. Why? Because he's going to, he's changing his focus. He's changing his direction. Now, he's going to still fulfill this promise, and he's going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We know that from uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse number 16. But temporarily, he has set aside the Jews because the Jews did not receive him as a, as a whole. And only when the Jews as a whole have accepted Christ as the Messiah, the promised Messiah, at the end of the tribulation, and those would be the people that survived the trip, the Jews that survived the tribulation, as well as those who believe in Christ as a result of the witnesses, the 144,000 witnesses that go out during the seven year period of time. But we know from Matthew chapter 16 here, it says, Peter, uh, the Lord rebuked Peter, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, I mean, Peter rebuked the Lord, and the Lord had to rebuke Peter because Peter didn't understand at this time that the Lord was refocusing or he was changing his focus from that of being the Savior, the Messiah, the promised King of the Jews, which the Jews knew about from Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. They knew that there, there was coming this kingdom. Uh, they believed that. In fact, in, Ma in, the, in Isaiah, it talks a lot about the coming king. Now, they had some difficulties understanding the difference between the suffering Savior and the conquering Savior, and most of the people, even in Christ, they were looking for him to be the, the conquering king who would deliver them from the oppression of Rome and so forth. But 
you know, if we don't understand these distinctions, and I want to help you to understand this because I really believe with all my heart that if you get the dispensations understood, now they are not, I should point out, they are not ways of salvation as some people have set up a straw man about us. They say, oh, well, you people that believe in dispensation, do you think there are different ways of salvation? No, we do not. People have always, from the beginning of time to the end of time, have always been saved by God's grace through faith in, in God or in, in the gospel as we have today, you see. Uh, for example, Genesis 15, 6, that says that Abraham believed God. When God told him he was, uh, he was going to give him a son in his own age, and God counted that to him for righteousness. Now, he may have had veiled understanding of a coming of promised Messiah, but he didn't understand what we do today. You see, you have to believe not only that Christ died for our sins, because we're all sinners, he was buried for three days to prove that he'd really paid the debt that was that uh, the payment that we owed to God, and that he rose again bodily. If you don't believe those that truth, you see, there are two facts, true proofs: the fact that he died for our sins, proven by his burial for three days, his bodily resurrection. A couple of Sundays we're going to talk about the bodily resurrection. There's over ten people, uh, or ten different times Jesus appeared to different individuals to prove to them. The fact that he had indeed risen from the dead, and so we want to we want to help you understand this, and so generally speaking, it begins the Christian principles for living start in about uh, uh, John chapter 13, and they go down to Revelation chapter 3. Now you say, well, why Revelation chapter 3? Well, in Revelation chapter 4, you don't find the church there anymore on earth. The church has been taken up into the presence of God, and then chapters 6 and following, you have the uh, the tribulation beginning the seven years of the tribulation now I might point out something here while I'm thinking about it even though the Apostle Paul refers to himself as the steward or the household manager for this particular dispensation you might ask the question well what about Peter and John and and James and Jude well I understand these men to be more or less supplemental to the writings of Paul in fact in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter, uh, when he writes about Paul's writing, he says, there are some things that are hard to be understand that Paul has written. He says, uh, consider the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which some things are hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures now that's very true uh, Paul is the stu refers to himself as the steward technically speaking we are not stewards first Peter 4 10 says as each of you has received a gift even so use or minister that gift for the benefit of other people as good so there's a the word as or like uh, is not the same as being the thing. See, uh, Paul is this. Paul is the steward of this dispensation. His services are no longer needed as an apostle or as a steward because he has given us all that we need for life and godliness. And this is exactly, in fact, what Peter says. He says, "Folks, you need to understand that uh, everything that we need." It says here in Second Peter one three. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Now, I believe that within the pages of this book, we have everything that we need for life and godliness. Now, obviously, it doesn't have stuff to do with medical stuff, but it has to do with life and godliness, how to be pleasing to God. But you need to understand, okay, what sections of the Bible should I focus in on? Now, I have a I have a book here that I gave out to our church people. It's the Daily Walk. It's put out by Walk Through the Bible. And uh, they have newer ones, but I, li I like this particular one. But I like to read through the Bible every year at least one time. And sometimes the New Testament more than that. But I try to do that to get acquainted with not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Now, let me share with you something <coughs> that maybe you haven't thought about. The Old Testament has value in that it serves as a negative example for us. In First Corinthians chapter, First um, Corinthians chapter ten, it is uh, the Apostle Paul says 
concerning the Jews of the Old Testament. He says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers, referring to the Old, Test, uh, the Old Testament believers, they were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized or came under the influence of Moses in the cloud and the sea. They ate the spiritual food, they drank the same spiritual drink, uh, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, that is the Jews, <coughs> in the Old Testament, God <coughs> was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, nor be idolaters, nor engage in sexual immorality, nor tempt the Lord, because if, or complain. Now, complaining is a bad thing, folks. A gripe, a Christian should never be griping. Now, there's all, and he says, now if you do these things, you can expect similar consequences to happen in your life today. So one of the things of the value of the Old Testament is negative example. Now there's another one that is mentioned in Romans chapter 15. Let me find it for you real quick. I believe it's verse number four. Yes, uh, First Corinthians, uh, Romans 15, four. He says, whatsoever things were written before that is in the Old Testament were for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You see, just as God fulfilled his promises concerning Christ's first coming to the Jews, he fulfilled all those promises. He says, in like manner, you can count on God when he gives you a promise as a New Testament Christian to keep that promise that he has made to you. I mentioned last time I was with you that uh, there's a cardinal in Rome who uh, said that, uh, in essence, you know, we're not going to focus in on the second the coming return of the Lord because he hadn't come back in some what is it 1981 years or whatever it was and uh, he says the Lord must be doing something else and maybe he made that promise and when he was drunk and so he you know he, he maybe you know that's not going to actually come to pass well that's absolute foolishness Jesus said in John 14 he says I'm going to come back for you to receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also see and we believe that there are many dwelling places in heaven right now where the spirit beings reside according to Ephesians chapter 6, but he's going to prepare a single place for all of you, and I believe that's a reference to the New Jerusalem. And by the way, the New Jerusalem that Jesus creates, that said he's going to make uh, that place, has never been contaminated, and nobody's been in it yet. See, the Old, the Old Testament and the New Testament Christians are in the paradise section of heaven, which is distinct from the place where the Lord is preparing for us. That place, I believe, is described for us in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 9 and following. The new Jerusalem, the heavenly new Jerusalem, comes out of heaven toward the earth. And you can, I think you can prove from Matthew chapter 24, one of the things that comes along with the Lord and, and New Testament Christians is our trailer house, so to speak, if you want to liken it to that. That's the new Jerusalem. And I believe that that is going to be the source of light during the millennium because the sun and the moon, the sun goes out, the moon goes out. So I believe that the new Jerusalem is going to come out of the third heaven. We're, that's our honeymoon suite. And we're, it's going to be like a satellite city that circles the earth every day. So people in the millennium will be able to see Christ. And yet that will be very, become very whole hum to them. And uh, they will have to be outwardly submissive to the rules during the, during the millennium. And, but inwardly they might be rebellious and that's why at the end of the tribulation when the devil is released for a brief period of time uh, many of them are going to follow him in, an in a final attempt to try to overthrow God and it's going gonna, it's gonna to end in failure and God will cast the devil, all the demons and all the unbelievers that follow the devil he will cast all of them to the lake of fire where they will suffer forever and ever now we will demonstrate to you from this particular chart that all of the seven dispensations including the millennial dispensation, uh, the dispensation of the future, is all, all of those are designed to prove to man that no matter what he does independently of God, he can never and never will be well-pleasing to God. And that's the same thing that's true of you as well. If you as a Christian try to live independently of God, now on this particular chart that I'm going to uh, share with you, or I hope you'll download it, as I said, it's a you can get it on kelseypeach.com. Right down here, there are Christian responsibilities and the failures, and then the judgment that will come. You see, and there's a little, I need to explain it to you, but God gives these responsibilities. Each of these dispensations has responsibilities, and then the failure, for example, Adam and Eve were told not to eat the forbidden fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What do they do? They ate it, they got kicked out of the garden. Okay, for the next, what is it, 1600 years approximately, they were to live according to their conscience. How did that end up? In total disaster. They were so bad, God had to wipe out everybody with the exception of, of Noah and his family off of the face of the earth and start over with them. 
And then you have a, the third period has to do with human government. When God says, okay, now I'm going to let you try to run the show here. And, of course, that ends up in failure. And God's having to come down and, and change the languages. And that's where the ethnic groups and the language changes took place uh, at the Tower of Babel. And then God deals with Abraham. Uh, he, he's no longer dealing with all the nations of the world. He deals with a specific man and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. You see, that's to whom the law was given eventually. And then, of course, a little later on, you, and that particular dispensation of promise ends up with the Jews in bondage in Egypt, in terrible situation, and Moses comes along, delivers them, or is used by God to deliver them. He gives them the Ten Commandments, even before God gives them. He says, well, just all that the Lord has said, we will do. They could have stayed living under the promise relationship with God. But no, they decided to go that route, and of course, for about the next 1,500 years, they, they didn't keep the law. They continually violated. And so, they ended up rejecting Jesus. Now, the judgment for the dispensation of law will take place during the tribulation time. So there's one week. There, there's called the 70 weeks of Daniel, mentioned in Daniel chapter what is it? Daniel chapter 9. Yeah, in, There's 70 weeks of years, or 490 years total. 483 of those years were fulfilled when Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on the cross. 483 years exactly. But there's one week left, one week of seven years that will have to be fulfilled. It will take place shortly after the rapture of the church and will share with you some things that have to take place or will take place just prior to the signing of the seven-year agreement. And I have a chart here. Here, I don't have it. Uh, I can get one to you if you want one. But I also have it on one of my blogs that it talks about the things that are to come. And I would like, if you're a Christian, I would like you not only to know how to present what the gospel is and share it, be sharing it with people, that's the only way they can get saved. God doesn't just zap them, as old Harold Camping used to say. No, and there's some people today that still believe that too, you see. No, the gospel needs to be presented to somebody. That's where you and I come in. And then, once the gospel has been presented to somebody, the Holy Spirit must take over, remove the natural blindness that everybody has, the satanic blindness, and with the Jews, the judicial blindness, before they can see and believe. See, uh, Philippians 1.29 says, It has been given on the behalf of you not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. Now, you still have to believe. Now, there are some people who say that, you know, you get saved before you believe. Well, no, you, there's... you. You and I are the ones that give the gospel to somebody. That Christ died, you can say to anybody. We don't believe in limited atonement. You can go up to anybody that the Holy Spirit leads you to, and you can say, my friend, Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Now, they may not respond immediately the first time you, you talk to them, as it was in the case of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, some who have the gift of evangelism are very effective in that. I know what the gospel is. I know how to share it. But uh, I feel that sometimes what I do is just like planting a seed. And uh, I, I keep saying to the Lord, well, it should be nice to have some of these people respond because I hope and do believe that there are people that yet are going to be saved because when all whom the Father has given to the Son have come to him, then the Lord's going to come back for his own and make it his bride. And we're going to go to that place that he's been preparing for us. And it's going to be a wonderful place. And then we're going to come back after that seven years of tribulation and we're going to rule and reign with Christ forever and ever. Uh, we will be above King David, who will be the resurrected Old Testament believer, who will be the regent here on earth, and under him will be other um, kings. You know, it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, under Jesus Christ and the church will be King David on earth, resurrected King David, and then he will rule under over the Gentile nations as well. Well, uh, I've run a little longer than I'd planned to, but uh, my my desire is that. I, I, I want you to make sure of your salvation. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.10, he says, make your call on the election sure. If you have any doubts about your salvation, as I used to, make sure of that. That's the most important thing. Because what would it profit if you gained the whole world? You became a multi-millionaire. I was talking to a businessman the other day, and he's, he was talking to me about somebody that he knew, and, and they virtually worship themselves, and they think they, you know, whatever man can think about dream he can achieve. That is not true. I wish I could play basketball like Michael, Je Michael Jordan. I never will. It doesn't bother me. God didn't want me to do that. God wants me to do what I'm doing right now, to share with you the good news concerning Christ and then how to live. You know, and I'm still learning. I don't have it all together. I'm still learning and I'm not going to come to the completed um, person that I'm going to be until the rapture takes place. 
even the people that are already going to heaven in the paradise section of it, they don't have everything they're going to get in the future. They don't have their glorified, resurrected bodies yet. Their emotions haven't been totally changed yet. Uh, the last thing that's going to be saved is the emotions, Second Peter, First Peter 1, 9. Uh, the body's going to be saved in the future at the rapture, Roman, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 23, I believe it is. The only part of us that's saved right now is the spirit that belongs to the mind. Uh, the spirit, um, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. We know that the spirit belongs to the mind because of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 23, I believe it is. I'll find it for you real quickly here. Yeah, it's the spirit that belongs to the mind. Um, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of or belonging to your mind. And 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, when you genuinely trust in Christ as your Savior, you, have, you can have assurance from the word of God. God says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. In the Gospel of John, about a hundred times the word believe is used. Now, there's a lot of guys who are adding all kinds of other things because they don't they deny the fact that there are carnal Christians instead of admitting that there are carnal Christians who don't know how to grow. We want to show you how you can grow, how you don't have to give in to the sin nature. You still have one. You'll have one until the day you die. See, And that's why Paul the Apostle, he said, learn how to walk by means of the Spirit and so you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You might be tempted, but you don't have to fulfill it. See? You, you know, Having the desire isn't the sin. It's when you pursue that and you do engage in the activity. That's when it becomes a sin. And the same way with the devil. There are 14 specific areas where he can attack your mind. Most people don't study that. They don't know it. Maybe they've never been taught. Well, by the grace of God, I, you know, I've been learning some of these things. I'm very thankful for the men who taught me when I was in school and when I was teachable. See, I haven't always been teachable. I'm not always teachable. But Second uh, Second Timothy two two says Paul told Timothy he says the thing that you have heard from me in the presence of wit many witnesses he says commit these to faithful people, not everybody to faithful people, people who are teachable who are willing to change. See, and it's getting harder and harder. For um, in fact, I was listening to one of my friends on Facebook, Doctor uh, Andy Woods. He was talking about. You know, finding a good church these days. There are fewer and fewer churches these days. There are many Laodicean type churches that have need of nothing. Um, they're the health, wealth, and happiness boys. And then there's some that are of you know, other classifications that are talked about in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the seven kinds of churches that exi have existed in church history. And we're, we have about four of them that are still uh, with us today. And uh, we'll have to talk about that at another time. But anyway, if you would, if you like this, please push like, and you know, uh, I want, I'm going to try to reach as many people as I can um, with what I have. But you can really help out. Maybe you don't know how to share the gospel. Maybe you can't do what I do. Maybe you don't have the gift of a pastor, teacher, or a teacher. But if you simply put share, if you think this is valuable to you, then share it with somebody else because it could reach the people that need to hear and want to hear, don't know where to find the good news concerning Christ. They're looking for some answers. But Scripture says they don't see God, and that's why we have to go looking for them. And if a person responds to natural revelation, uh, he or she, God will see to it that that person gets more revelation concerning the good news about Christ. And when I talk about revelation, I'm talk not talking about you know, the book of Revelation. I'm talking about truth that's already here that need, they need to hear in order to be saved. And that's where you and I can come into the picture. And if you'll help me with this, you know, I want to go home to heaven. I talked to a fellow just a couple days ago. I was working in my yard here, and um, he says, Well, I hope the Lord wait a little longer. I, I've tried to point out to him, Hey, listen, when all whom the Father has given to the Son have come to him, he's going to come back. I don't know how many, that, where those people are. They could be all the way around the world. They could be in Asia. Some of you are perhaps listening to my, right, me right now in Asia or, or Africa. You know, our son, My son Bill put a lot of you on my Facebook here. I don't even know some of you. But if you'll help me share the gospel, just push share, like. Or if you don't like it, tell me you don't like it. And I'll try to answer the questions that you may have. But we're here to try to help you uh, to be saved and then grow in the sphere of grace and in the knowledge of Christ. And then put into practice what you're learning. God's counting on you. And if you're not going to serve him by bearing witness for him, if you're not going to glorify him, why should he keep you here on earth? See, I want to be well-pleasing to the Lord, as 2 Corinthians 5, 8, 9 says. You know, there's a lot of Christians that are just going through their own thing, doing their own thing. See, you're not pleasing to God. God could severely discipline and chase you if you're a child of His. If you're not a child of God, you're gonna, you have a bad future awaiting you. Uh, and 
by the way, there's no universal reconciliation, as some people are erroneously teaching, and people are buying into that stuff. So anyway, back to my original thing. If you'll get this chart, uh, it's just go to KelseyPeach.com, and on the left-hand side on the bottom, it says Dispensation Chart. Just click on that, and it'll come up, and then just print it out, and then I'll try to, uh, one of the next, maybe next time I'll try to get together with you and go through it. I think it's rather self-explanatory. Uh, Tom Ice and uh, Tim LaHaye have a similar one here. You can see on the very bottom they have a larger one. and uh, But this is going to be something you can carry in your Bible. Um, let me see here. I believe I saw it here right in the front. It's a really big chart. Yeah, here it is. Let's see how big the chart is. That was a huge chart. and it's. Uh, but they have a lot of valuable information in here, and I would encourage it. It's just called Charting the End Times. Uh, if you don't mind used books, I can show you where you can get some used books cheaper. Uh, this one I bought it new. It was like 25 bucks. It probably costs more today, but uh, you know, however you like it. I'm interested in the content, not so much of the, the the quality. I mean, the the bindings all getting worn off, so that, that doesn't matter to me. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful to you, and uh, we want to bless you, and we want God to bless you as you're obedient to Him and His Word. And in order for God to bless you, you need to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and rose again, and then you need to be desirous to be willing to do what God wants you to do. And when you sin, you confess it openly and freely to Him. See, you don't try to cover it up. The other day when we were observing the Lord's table, uh, somebody mentioned to me that he, he engaged in a particular sinful activity, and he said he got convicted to go make it right. And I said, that's the right thing to do. You, see? you want to have a clear conscience before God. See, Have all known sins confessed. You can't confess them if you don't know about them. See. You don't just generalize them. Oh, well, just God forgive me of all my sins. No, that's not what you do. In fact, confession is not what an unsaved person does to get saved. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Confession invol involves Christians who have sinned. And uh, most often it comes from the sin nature that we sin, although we periodically give in to the devil and or the world system. But we want to help you as best we can. So uh, until next time, this is Kelsey Peach. Don't forget to go to KelseyPeach.com, get the chart. And I'll try to go through this with you so it'll uh, help you. And I'm really hoping and praying that it'll make a great difference in your life. You'll enjoy reading the Bible. I, I get up early and you know spend time reading it myself. I use this daily walk thing. And if you can, you want to ask about that, I can show you where you can get that too or something very similar to that. And so you can read through the Bible in a whole year. You'll know as you're going through the Old Testament, yeah, this is inf information for me to know and to value from it. Oh, and by one, one other thing in reference to the Old Testament, not only is it a negative example, gives us hope for the future as we claim the promises, but without the Old Testament, you couldn't get a, uh, the picture that God wants us to have of him right now. See, you need the Old Testament to learn about God. Now, we also know, by the way, this addition, Ephesians 2, 7, now, the difference between ages and dispensation. Dispensations are limited to time. Ages precede and follow dispensations. It says in Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, God will keep on revealing to us certain things about himself, just like a many-faceted diamond. Uh, you'll never get bored in heaven once you get there, if you're a Christian. If you go to hell, which we hope you don't, and we, hope, we don't want anybody to go there, and salvation is available to all mankind. But you've got to help me get it out. Well, i got to quit. Man, I ran longer than I should have. Have a great evening. This is a beautiful day that the Lord has made, so we will rejoice and be glad in it, and pretty soon maybe the stars will be out. But until next time, blessings on you as you're obedient to the Lord. Bye.